in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, and indeed all praise belongs to Him. Um, I just want to say that I'm very happy to see such a diverse group of people here. Alhamdulillah, I uh, hope it's going to be a very beneficial and interesting evening for everyone. Um, also, um, obviously thank you for taking the time out to come here, which is it's a pleasure to always see different faces. I um, also want to give a special thanks to the Islamic Human Rights Commission, who sponsored the event, and also Ahmed al Deen, who actually arranged, helped arrange, arrange the event, which um, to bring Professor Rahman here. Um, so just a brief background into the Islamic Human Rights Commission, who actually sponsored the event. They specialise in academic research on anti-Muslim hate crime and Islamophobia. They've published reports in the UK, France and uh, USA. So that's just a brief background. As for the main event that we're here for tonight, so inshallah we'll be talking about um, Andalus, a brief history of Andalus, which is Muslim rule Spain and stem on to Islamophobia and how that stemmed initially from there and Professor's theory on how that evolved. Um, just a brief background in terms of Professor Ramon Rosogo. In case, in case there are people in the audience who are not aware of the Professor and um, what exactly he's involved in, he's an Associate Professor at Ethnic Studies Department in the University of Berkeley in the USA. Um, he's one of the leading decolonial thinkers and academics in the world and alhamdulillah the, the professor has also been instrumental in setting up and working in decolonial projects including, just to name a few, the Decolonial Translation Group, the Centre for Study and Investigation for Global Dialogues, which the Critical Muslim Studies Summer School in Granada in Spain is also a part of. Oh, excuse me, this. Can everyone hear me like this? Yeah. Um, also, just another thing, uh, Professor Grosvogel is also an author of various books and articles including colonial subjects which were published in 2003. So, the event itself is going to be around an hour long and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. So, if there are any questions that anyone has in mind, save them till the end of the topic and try and keep them around the topic itself. I know there's people that might want to ask a few various different questions, and that's fine. If we stick to the topic in hand, and then if there's any further questions that anyone wants to ask the professor himself, and maybe his thoughts on something, then feel free to do that at the end. So, without delaying things any further, I just want to thank you for being patient and hand it over to the Professor Ramon. Yeah. Salam alaikum. Uh, you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, no. You don't hear me there. So it's probably the microphone. You don't hear me there? No. Or maybe there's something it's not working. Mm -hmm. Maybe the, the microphone. So now? Yes, now it works. Okay. Salam alaikum to all of you. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, I will also invite it basically to talk about and the, the reason I go, I want to you know, basically I discuss this history. Uh, sometimes in among Muslims there is this nostalgia about Al Andalus and the loss of Al Andalus. And, and I want to clarify that I try to go back to that history, and not so much with nostalgia, but because we. If you don't understand the history of the conquest of Al Andalus, it's very difficult you will understand the world we live. Okay, so this is why I go to that history. I don't go because of course it was a big loss, all of that, you know, we can cry about it forever, but I don't think that we should look at this history uh, just in the, from this perspective. I think we should look and the history to understand the world we live today. Because a lot of what happened in the conquest of Al-Andalus is related to what happened in the world after the fall of Al-Andalus. And there's some people talking about this, the world we live as a post-Andalusian moment. You know, because what happened is that a lot of the methods they used to colonize or conquest Al-Andalus 
were later rehearsed in the conquest of other parts of the world. So my thesis is that the European colonial expansion began in the conquest of Al-Andalus. You know, and that's why the conquest of Al-Andalus has world historical significance. Uh, is, you know, is many people look at it, oh, that's another conquest in history. No, it's not just another conquest in history because of what happened later. If, let's say, uh, the conquest of Alanda would have happened and there would have not been a colonial expansion after the fall of you know, Alanda to the, to the Americas, if that would have, won't have happened, it would have been maybe an anecdotal thing in history. But because the European, that wave of European colonial expansion that transformed the world uh, at a global scale, okay, uh, happened uh, right after the fall of Al-Andalus. And the fall of Al-Andalus was that first moment of the European colonial expansion. That's why we need to look back at this history in a more careful way okay, to understand the world we live today. So I'm not, I'm not going back to Al-Andalus and that history for nostalgic reasons. I'm going back there so we understand the world we live today. Uh, having said that, uh, we probably would have to go back in history to, uh, you know, probably, uh, you know, more than uh, you know, several thousand years ago to really understand uh, what it means. So if I tell you the fall of Alandas uh, and I don't tell you what was being destroyed and what was replacing what was got destroyed, it just becomes like meaningless. It doesn't make that much of a sense. So that's why, in order to understand the world historical significance of the fall of Al-Andalus, we also have to go back in history. So we understand exactly what was being destroyed and what was replacing what was being destroyed. This is very important. So I would like to go back to a, a, you know, the period of a Jesus. Okay? Uh, for Christians, Jesus is the Son of God. For Muslims, Jesus is a prophet, right? So there is this disagreement. But in terms of, if you look at history, you look at the message of Jesus, there might be something that can be shared there. Okay? So, for example, uh, the early Christianity, uh, early Christianity basically was uh, has there in the origins a notion that is shared by many cultures around the world uh, that is a notion of unity with difference. That concept, that concept is a cosmological concept. The concept that we are all, you know, inside a one cosmos, one unity. And inside that, there are all these, you know, heterogeneous forms of life. Uh, we all coexist with this unity, but the difference, heterogeneity, is inside this notion of unity. And you can see that from, you know, the diversity of forms of life to even different cultures, etc., inside the human experience, right? So, uh, in a sense, the creation has in itself this, this notion. No? Uh, and, and so this, uh, um, this is at the moment uh, of early Christianity. I'm using here a term that is really problematic because Jesus never called himself Christian. Okay? That's a reconstruction done several you know, centuries later. In fact, at the moment, Jesus saw himself as some kind of dissidence within 
the Jewish tradition. Okay? Uh, he was basically fighting some, uh, let's put it this way, uh, some struggles inside the Jewish tradition. That, uh, and so he was, he, all Jesus and his followers saw themselves as Jews at the moment. No? They didn't see themselves as founding some other tradition. You know, they were just seeing themselves as a continuation of the prophetic tradition. And therefore there was no at the moment of what well, he was alive. No? And, and and of also a, a good period after, you know, this uh, you have uh, this uh, you know, this understanding. Even if you look at the uh, St. Paul, you know, that is considered for the Christian as a major founder of Christianity, etc. Even there, there is a discussion because uh, there are some scholars that have demonstrated that St. Paul himself was seeing himself inside the, the Jewish tradition and not outside that. So, so these, a lot of things of this early period, so I'm using early Christianity for the sake of understanding each other, okay, but not uh, not attributing to it some kind of uh, real correspondence, okay, and just for communication purposes, so we understand what Peter are talking about. So that early Christian, that moment of uh, of Jesus, you have a, basically a, the message in the message of Jesus and the followers was this notion of unity with defense. Okay? That is called among indigenous people in South America, Pachamama, it's called in many parts of Africa, Ubuntu, and it's called among Muslims, Tawit, you know, the notion of Tawit. So you can find this notion in different places around the world. It's not a notion that is unique to Muslims. It's, it's the notion that in many cultures you can find that especially uh, in you know, in indigenous cultures uh, around the world this, there is this ancestral notion of of tawit in Islam you know it's uh, they're already there but called differently by different cultures so it was, it was it's been there so and and so on uh, and you could find that in also in the prophetic tradition Jewish prophetic tradition same notion so what is important about this notion is that uh, at the time, if you remember, uh, there was a Roman Empire. And, and a lot of the, at the time, uh, the Roman Empire basically was uh, at the time, uh, I don't know that English is, uh, uh, you know, poly. Uh, was it? Okay. I'm sorry? That believe in different gods? Uh, Polytheism. Thank you. In English, I forgot the term. Uh, so, polytheistic, you know, and so the Roman Empire, etc., was polytheistic. It was highly influenced by Greek cosmology, you know, at the time, which is very different from the Semitic cosmology. And so it was all these disagreements, etc. But the point is that the, the Roman Empire basically saw itself as some kind of sacred power structure. You know? And what happened with the notion of you know, unity with difference is that this notion became kind of a revolutionary notion uh, because it was basically saying that this notion of unity, we are all part of the same creation. Nobody is, uh, you know, so we are all sacred with small s, okay? In the sense that all the creation is coming from the same source and we are all living within one cosmos and this is the coexistence of difference inside that and the human experience have all these different cultures, etc. But there is this common understanding that the creation, we're all created differently, but in a sense, within this unity, you know? So we're all sacred from with a small s, but nobody is sacred with a capital S. Which means that, you know, Allah, you know, in this case, is, is beyond, okay? 
As a matter of fact, I always ask Christians uh, what was the term used by Jesus to call that you know sacred being, okay? And, and many Christians don't know what the, what was the term used. Uh, and the reason they don't know is because a lot of Christian dogs that I'm going to discuss in a few minutes, have hidden the tradition uh, of uh, Jesus from them. You know, have kind of hidden a lot of things. So how come you have a tradition of 2,000 years where the people who are followers of that, they don't know the word used by the main, you know, character of the tradition, Christianity, uh, for calling this uh, you know, a uh, uh, sacred being, you know. So what was the term? Someone knows here? Anybody knows the term? What language did Jesus speak at the time? Uh, Aramaic. Aramaic, thank you. So it was Aramaic. It was not uh, Hebrew, it was not, it was Aramaic language which is a Semitic language, okay? So the term used was Allah, Allah. That was the term, okay? I was also asked, how did Jesus pray? Someone knows? You, you seem to know all this stuff, yes. <laughs> Yeah, how do you know this? You just hear it every once in a while. But from whom and where? The Coptic Christian. Thank you. Isn't the Coptic Christian Bible? Because the, Christ, the Coptic Christian Bible is written in Aramean language. What happened with a lot of the Christians today is that you get a translation from the Aramean language of the Bible to Greek language. I mean, uh, more than a thousand years ago, then from Greek to Latin, and then from Latin to all these contemporary languages. So what you have is we're lost in translation because you have the translation of the translation of the translation. And so what we're reading as part of the Bible is, is a very problematic thing because it has nothing to do with the original uh, you know, text because in our real language, uh, it's a Semitic language, and the problem in translation is not only you have to watch for words you translate, but you have to watch for the cosmology. And what happens is that you translate without taking good care of translating the cosmology, then the tradition gets colonized by another cosmology. So a lot of what we read as contemporary Bible is really Greek cosmology. It's not the Semitic cosmology of Aramean language. It's Greek cosmology, that's what we're reading. So we're lost in translation, in a sense. And so uh, I have the opportunity to know more about this just because I, there's some uh, scholar in the University of Sevilla in, in Spain who has done work translating directly from Aramean, the Bible from Aramean language to Spanish without and taking good care of the cosmological translation, you see, and not passing through Greek, Latin, or any language like that, you see, and trying to capture uh, and respect the cosmology. And when you do that exercise, you get shocked because it's the, you know, what we're reading as the Bible, and, you know, it's have nothing to do with the original Bible, you know. It's a complete uh, transformation, okay? And so, uh, so for example, uh, one of the things described in the Aramean Bible is that he would go to his knees and put his forefront in, in, on the earth, you know, on the, on the ground for to pray. You know, does it sound familiar? If he was not doing like this, like the church would like to, you know, like this, it was not like that. But he would go to his, you know, his, the frog he said, on the ground. 
And I mean, the word he uses a lot. A lot is a